Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the macroverse. Today, we're going to talk about the SOM rule recession indicator. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. So, this indicator <laughs> has been making waves over the last few days and a lot of news articles about it, a lot of people on Twitter talking about it. So I did think that I would at least come in here and, and provide my two Satoshis on the matter. So one of the things is, first of all, we need to understand what it is we're talking about. Okay, so the SOM rule recession indicator it was developed by an economist named Claudia Som, who's actually somewhat active on Twitter. Uh, I would encourage you to, to actually go follow her uh, for some useful insights into the economy. But it's basically based on the idea that, and I'll link her Twitter in the, uh, in the description below, but it's basically based on the idea that changes in the unemployment rate can be used to identify the onset of a recession. Now, there have been a lot of news articles over the last few days that have come out and said that the SOM rule recession indicator was triggered. However, that is not true. Okay, now the reason it's important to note whether it has been triggered or not is because normally when it is triggered, that typically marks the onset of a recession within a few months, right? Within about a three month window, it tends to mark the onset of a recession. <coughs> and if you think this is the first time I've ever spoken about this indicator, that's actually not true. We spoke about this indicator, I believe, almost a year ago. And we noted back then that it was nowhere close to, you know, to, to, to triggering that, that, that threshold, right? At the time, it was only 0.03%, 0.03%. Today, it is at 0.33%, but the trigger will not happen until it reaches 0.5%. Now, where are these percentages coming from? The rule states that if the three-month moving average of the unemployment rate increases by 0.5 percentage points or more above its low for the previous year, <coughs> it is considered a recession signal. This indicator is considered simple and quick to use and has been shown to be a reliable indicator of recessions in the past. Now, we're going to figure out whether that's true or not, right? <coughs> so let's go take a look at the last several recessions and see what happened once this indicator triggered, okay? So we'll first go back to, to 2020. You can see that it triggered, but in this case, when the trigger occurred, the market had already bottomed, right? But when it was at around 0.27%, from the, from the mark of 0.27, to 4%, which is a huge move in a single month, that's that's where the S&P 500 capitulated, okay? If you go back to more typical recessions, right, where they're, they're longer, they take years to play out, go back and look at the financial crisis. Once, and by the way, this gray line here that you see going across the page, that is the 0.5% threshold. So you can see it triggered here in February of 2008. And, of course, you can see what happened to the S&P 500 after it. Nothing good occurred in the S&P 500 after it, after that, basically for the next year. The market just went down for essentially a year straight uh, with, with occasional rallies, right, just to keep you interested. But it triggered in February. The recession was eventually backdated to December, right, to December. But, it, again, it triggered in February, backdate to December, and then it lasted until June of 2009, okay? So in this case, it would have been a good signal, right? I mean, had you waited for this to signal, you would have missed the top, right? But even, you know, even getting out or taking some profits, even at just off the highs, you would have avoided a majority of the downside, okay? Now let's go look at the dot-com crash. Where did it signal? It signaled in June of 2001, the recession started in March, right? So again, it, it tends to be good to within about a three-month window or so. Now, what happened after it triggered in June? The market had actually topped one month earlier, okay? 
and that was just a lower high. It wasn't even sort of the cycle high. It was just a lower high. And after that, starting from, you know, starting from June 2001, when it triggered, the market did not even bottom until October 2002. So again, we had another full year where the market went down. So those were the last two major recessions that we've had where the SOM rule worked out pretty well, right? Like had you just waited for it to trigger and, and then adjusted your strategy, it would not have been the worst strategy to go with. You might ask, well, well why wait? I mean, so th there, there is this thing of like it, it sometimes goes up, but then doesn't actually hit that trigger, right? Now, <laughs> has it gone up to this level before without, without hitting that trigger? I don't know. I mean, 0.33% is pretty high. I mean, you can see that when it hit, when it hit at last cycle, it ended up leading into a recession. Same thing as cycle before, same thing cycle before. I will say, by the way, I was reading through Claudia Assam's tweets. Her expectation, if, unless, I, unless I misread, but her expectation is that this will trigger in early 2024, but she also thinks we'll avoid a recession for what it's worth. Okay. So those are probably important things to consider as well. So I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of unknowns in this economy, right? You have you have the stock market, which had its seasonal correction, and, and it's now we're trying to figure out if it's just doing what it normally does in Q4, which is sort of go sideways and, and maybe slightly up, or if we're pricing in a recession. Uh, that all still remains to be seen. And even if a recession occurs, it doesn't mean that the market can't rally into it. Oftentimes, markets rally into recessions, right? Oftentimes it rallies into recessions. And we're sort of at an interesting point where anyone who is bullish on the market will, of course, point to price action. And why shouldn't they, right? Price action is king. And, <laughs> and use that as justification that, you know, that, that, that new highs are coming. And again, the S&P can put in new highs going into a recession. It's, it, it often occurs, not always. I mean, in the dot-com crash, you can see that it had already rolled over and was turning down. But in the financial crisis, you know, just before the recession, the S&P put in a new high. Like, it is possible. That sort of stuff is possible. And of course, the people who are bearish will, will simply just say, you know, rallies in a recession are pretty normal, right? So again, I mean, you can, you can take either side uh, there's no guarantee. My expectation for what it's worth, I think we will likely have a recession. Uh, if we don't, I would expect it to be a recession scare, kind of like 2016, where you come close to one and the market still sells off to some degree, but it doesn't sell off as badly as people think it will, right? So I think we'll probably have a recession at the end of this business cycle. Um, but again, how long that takes, that's, that's really anyone's guess. I mean, at this point, it, it, I mean, it's, the economy has been holding on for, for a long time so far. So we've, we've sort of covered the last three. Now let's go back and look at, at, at the, the late 80s. Because here you can see the recession, the sum rule recession indicator triggered in October of 1990. And then the market bottomed basically right after it. Almost in that month, it bottomed. Also, keep in mind, though, that the S&P, right, you can see here in July of 1990, had a pretty sizable correction, right? Let's go, let's go figure out exactly what that correction was, uh, just, so we, just so we have it um, on hand. Okay, so this is it right here. This is the correction that the S&P 500 had. You can see that it started here in July of 1990, and the S&P ended up dropping about 20%, about a 20% drop. And, you know, July was red, August was red, September was red, and October was red. So you essentially had four red months in a row, and you had a recession, right? And even though, I mean, even though the market bottomed out in October, it didn't really go... I mean, it didn't really take out these prior highs until February of 91, right? So it wasn't until the following year that it took out those highs. But again, this is an example where 
the SOM rule triggered recession warning in October, and then the recession ended up being backdated to July. So again, within about a three-month window, it was fairly accurate in predicting the onset of recession. But in this case, it was not as successful in helping to identify <coughs> you know, mar you know, market activity over the next year. If you had sold in October of 1990 when this signaled and waited a year, right, and you got in in October of 91, the price would have actually been slightly higher. Not much higher from where you would have sold at, um, but a little bit higher, right? I mean, you're talking about a move from, you know, 314 up to up to 386, right? So it's a, it's a somewhat significant move. So it shows you there's not, even with these indicators, that have a pretty good track record of predicting when the onset of a recession occurs, it's still hard to say if following that strategy is always going to work out. And, and you know, the early 1990s is a great example of that. Now, we can go back and, and look at, at these other cycles. Um, perhaps let's just go in order starting in, in 1970. The SOM rule recession indicator triggered in March. Looks like it triggered in, in March of 1970. And the S&P then dropped from around 88 down to around 69. Okay, so a somewhat sizable correction by the S&P after the SOM rule recession indicator triggered. And <laughs> once it triggered in February, or sorry, in, yeah, in, in, in March, the recession eventually was backdated, it looks like, to December. So again, about a three-month window from where the recession started. Then if you look at 1973, 1974, you will see the SOM rule recession indicator triggered here in July. The recession, the recession after it triggered in July, the recession was eventually backdated to November. So that ended up being backdated by about half a year. Okay. Now, after it triggered, the market still sold off, right? So you have an example in, in in 1970, where the market sold off after it triggered, an example in 1974, where the market sold off after it triggered, and then let's go look at the 80s. Here's an example where it triggered in February. The recession was backdated to January, so within that three-month window, and what ended up happening is after it triggered, the market went slightly up to about 118 and then dropped a good amount, right? I mean, it dropped you know, somewhat considerably down to about less than 100, right? So you're talking about a 20% drop after, after that trigger occurred. And then finally, you had one other trigger here. We had two recessions in the early 80s, sort of back to back. You had it trigger in November of 1981. And we're gonna have to zoom, we're gonna have to fix this and sort of zoom in here, right? So it triggered here in November of 1981. The market, the S&P at the time was at around 121. And over the next year, it sort of made its way down to about 100. So again, about a 20% drop after the trigger occurred. Okay, so out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight recessions, seven of them, it you know, selling, maybe I shouldn't say it like that, right? Seven of them, the market went down significantly after it triggered. <laughs> but one of them did not, and that was in, in the 1990s. Again, it hasn't even triggered yet, right? It hasn't even triggered yet. Now, we could perhaps go look at, there's four other examples. So just for the sake of completeness, we will go through them. I, I don't really want to leave any stone unturned over here. So this first one over here, you know, we really don't have enough data for because, I mean, it, it, you know, the recession was already sort of ongoing um, when we even had this. Uh, and you can see that the market did eventually fall. So, I mean, it seems like it probably would have worked out. Uh, if you go look at the next three recessions, here's an example. And I was looking at this one before I made this video. And it was one of the reasons why I made the video, because this shows you a completely different outcome where it triggered in 1953 and then the market just went up, right? The market just went up. It then triggered as well here in 1957. The market dropped a little bit, right? A little bit 
hung out at those lows for a few months and then went up. In this case, in, in, in this last case, it triggered in November. The recession was backdated to June. So within a few months here, it triggered in October. The recession was backdated to August. So again, within that three-month window. And then finally, here, you can see that it, 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 tr it got a false trigger, right? I mean, it went above it, but it didn't really mean recession immediately. We actually came back down for a few months, and then it went up. And then after it triggered, again, the market went slightly lower, and then it just went up, right? So what does this tell us? It tells us that there is no sure thing with this stuff, right? I can look at this. I can look at this, and I can pick out a majority of these cases, a majority of the cases, the market went down after it triggered, right? We had a you know pretty bad recession in, in a lot of these cases. But there are some cases like 1990 and like in the in the 50s where it, it did not provide as much of a of, of 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 a useful tool in terms of navigating the markets. Now, it has generally been a greedy a, a, a great tool for identifying if you're in a recession, right? In almost all of these cases. You know, except for that one that we just looked at right here. And again, a recession eventually came, right, just a few months later. But generally speaking, when it triggers, it means there's a recession, right? As you can see, right, if it triggers, if we go above that 0.5% level, it has historically meant recession. Now, some of the times, the market sold off a lot over the following year, and then other times it didn't. So again, <laughs> this is why investing uh, is macro macro investing is, is very difficult because you can find something that might work 70 or 80 percent of the time, but it doesn't mean that it's going to work every time, right? And so building out a strategy around that could work and is likely to work, but there's an example, there's, there's reasons why it might not, and that's why hedging is always a good, a good thing to do. I mean, if anything that I've learned over the last several years of investing, hedging is always a great thing to do. Always, you know? And, and I've, I've learned it consistently, right? It's always a good idea to have a hedge. It's like with crypto, you know, you can, you can look at the market and, and think of reasons why there's risk, but being exposed in some way can, can often be helpful, right? It, it helps calm the, the FOMO that exists. And that's why I've said, right, that's why we focus on, on things like Bitcoin dominance, because it gives you exposure to crypto through Bitcoin if you want it while minimizing the, the risk that the altcoin market brings. Now, again, today is a great day where a lot of altcoins are going up. And, and I know people are, are feeling that FOMO. But, um, you know, I'll still stand by my views that, that, that the Bitcoin dominance will likely continue to going will likely continue going higher. And, and it does protect you from the from the downside risk of the altcoin market. Doesn't mean you can't make money. Uh, just like the S and P, I mean, you know, the, the S and P can often rally into a recession, um, but it's just something to consider. So, where are we today? Again, it's starting to move up pretty quickly because just a few months ago, it was essentially at zero percent. I mean, we were at the lows. <coughs> we were at the lows, but it's starting to move higher, and it's also starting to move higher pretty quickly. So, if you were to look at a month-over-month -month percentage change of it you can see that it's starting to move up quickly, okay? And the, the rate of change is going up. And the reason is because the unemployment rate has been going higher. Now, if you were to look at the unemployment rate, one of the things you'll notice is it, it had been doing some, some pattern, right? There, there was a pattern it had been following for a while, and it seems like it, it might be breaking out of that pattern. That, basically, that pattern was... Um, Sorry, let me just zoom out here. The pattern that it was sort of doing was it would it would spike up and then just spend the next few months going back down. Spike up, two months going down. Spike up, two months going down. And then it spiked, and then instead of going down, it went sideways, and then it went up. So something has changed. Now, how will the SOM rule recession indicator trigger? What would cause it to trigger? Well, you would need to see continued prints at higher levels. It is not. I mean, so so one of the reasons why I think a lot of people thought that the SOM rule recession indicator triggered is because the low for the unemployment rate, the low for it was 3.4%, right? And now the unemployment rate is at 3.9%.
So it's, you know, you can see it's it's a half a point, right, off the lows, half a percentage off the lows from 3.4 to 3.9. But as we said earlier, the sum rule recession indicator is based on the three-month moving average of the unemployment rate. There's a lot of noise in any given, any single data point, right? A lot of noise in any single data point. And so by smoothing it out, so getting, say, like a three-month moving average, it smooths out all this noise. And you can see here... Um, just how you know just how much cleaner it is to look at just sort of the pink line and and you can see how it how it sort of just cuts through the data and it smooths out the noise so the three month moving average is now at 3.83 percent the unemployment rate is at 3.9 percent if you get another month <coughs> where let's say the unemployment rate is at 3.9 percent then it's going to that that metric is going to get pretty close to triggering if it goes to 4% or 4.1%, I mean, if you, let's say you get two months where it goes to 4%, it's going to trigger, right? It would, it would trigger in that case. So it all depends on, on if it triggers or not. And again, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, there's, there's risks that it does. It seems like the market is, is softening up. Um, you know, if you look at continued claims, we can see that they've gone higher, indicating that people are having a harder time finding a new job once they get laid off. But initial claims remain relatively low, right? Initial claims remain relatively low. So again, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say. And, and, and even if it does happen, it's hard to say at what, at what rate it happens. There's a chance that the unemployment rate next month comes in lower. Like maybe it comes in at, <laughs> at a lower valuation, gets everyone to think that it won't happen. And then in, in 2024, it goes to the upside. So just as a reminder that the person who created this indicator thinks that it will trigger in early 2024. Okay. Um, I think they're suspecting that whatever comes in December will not be sufficiently high to, to cause this to get to, to, to cause the, the, the three month moving average to get to 0.5%. If we had to think about the three month moving average for a second, right? The last three data points have been 3.8, 3.8, and 3.9. Okay. That's why it's gone up so much is because it, it went from including this data point down here at 3.5 in July to not including it at all. Right? So instead of including any of these data points down here, it's now just looking at 3.8, 3.8, and 3.9. So if you get another print at 3.9, and then it replaces 3.8 with 3.9, you can see how it's going to slowly go up. If it goes up to four or 4.1, then it's going the three-month moving average is going to go up even quicker. And the issue for the Fed is if it starts to go up too quickly, then they could be stuck in a rock and a hard place where you have inflation still high and the labor market showing weakness. The counterpoint, though, is if the labor market doesn't show weakness, then that could very well likely be a, a tailwind for inflation. So, I mean, it basically just makes the problem last longer than it, than it otherwise needs to be. Um, so that is the SOM rule recession indicator. I wanted to do a video on it because it seems like there had been a lot of people talking about it in the news and stuff and, and saying that it had triggered and it actually hasn't triggered yet. There are some individual states, I believe that it has triggered for. So if you were to look at all the different 50 states, you'll, I think you'll see that for some of them, uh, it is starting to trigger, but still for a lot of them, it, it hasn't yet. Um, but this is a useful indicator. And, and we'll, we'll continue to follow it. There aren't really many examples. I mean, one of the most common questions I think I saw was why 0.5%, right? I mean, there's not a lot of examples where it even got this high and it didn't eventually cross the line, right? Like if you were to look back at 0.33%, at when's the last time it got that high and did not eventually trigger the warning? Um, just sort of looking at the line across the page at that level, I don't really see anything in, in, I mean, here's, here it went to 0.3. So it got pretty close. But yeah, I'm not really seeing many examples. Here, here's an example. So here's an example in 1951 where it went to 0.33% and, and then it just came back down. So it did not, it did not trigger, right? And that happened in November. November of, of 1951. This one here, we're at 0.33% in October of, of 2023. So I, I guess it depends on 
it really, I mean, a lot is riding on the labor market, right? Oh, there's a lot riding on the labor market. For people that are, you know, that are that are buying risk assets right now, I imagine they're counting on a soft landing, um, which is not completely out of the question, right? And and for people who are who are more risk averse, they're probably more so thinking that the labor market continues to show weakness. And look, I would say that this is a, a useful indicator. It's not everything. Um, and again, the person who created it thinks, I believe, that it'll break next year. I think she, I think she said that she thinks that it will, um, it will trigger. But her base case is that a recession will not occur. Um, so again, I'll, I'll link to her Twitter so you can follow her. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's a, a good indicator to take a look at. And, and, and also just as a friendly reminder, right? It often means, when it triggers, it often means bad times are coming. But there are a few cases where it has not meant that. Okay, so please remember that. There are a few cases where it has not meant that, although the vast majority of them, we did see a, a fairly significant sell-off in the S&P after it triggered, and especially in, in the last two major recessions, right, after it triggered. Um, and, and by the way, if you, if you look at the last couple of recessions, you can see it started to move up, got to around that 0.3 level, and it only took another couple of months before it triggered. That was in, in the financial crisis. In the dot-com crash, you can see it hit 0.33%, which is where we are right now, in March. And then it, it still didn't trigger until July, right? So it still took a few months before it triggered. And the reason that can happen is if the unemployment rate, you know, you can kind of see it, right? Like if it is moving up, but there's still a, a potential where it, it comes back down, finds like a higher low, right? You have you know, you have 3.4 and then 3.4 and then 3.5. There's always an example where it could come back down to 3.6 or 3.7 and, and then delay this whole thing by, by a few more months, right? So there's always the, the, the risk that that happens as well. Anyways, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, this is just on the, on the SOM rule recession indicator. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And uh, we will, of course, talk more about uh, more about the markets in, in upcoming videos. I, I always sometimes feel bad about making these videos because I know people more so care about about the markets. Um, and especially with, you know, Bitcoin is is here at, at, at 35K. So I'm sure everyone is watching that. Uh, the next video that I do will probably be on, on Bitcoin and, and looking at it, looking at how it has historically behaved with respect to tightening cycles and, and um, at least the few data point, you know, the one data point that we have. Um, but we'll take a look about at that hopefully in the next video. But yeah, I, I, I don't mean to to just not talk about uh, the markets as frequently. It just seems like a lot of this macro stuff that we've briefly discussed over the last year is starting to make moves and it seems relevant to follow it, especially when you get a move like this, right? When it goes from 0.2% to 0.33% in a single month. I mean, that is a big jump for, for something like this. There's one last thing that I know a lot of people have, have looked at as well. And, and that is the another way that, that some people sort of measure the onset of a recession is when the 36-month moving average of the unemployment rate. So when the unemployment rate goes above the 36-month moving average, right? So like here, right? That marks sort of the onset of a recession, right? Onset of a recession, onset of a recession, et cetera, right? When, it, when the three-month, or sorry, when the, when the unemployment rate goes above the 36-month moving average, right? And if you were to overlay like the S&P onto this chart, right? One of the things you'll see here, right? Where it crosses it, you can see what the S&P did after it crossed it. Same thing here after it crossed, the, the S&P dropped considerably. Um, here, so he, let me just go through them. In 70, 1970, you can see that it crossed right here in October. Again, the market fell for just a, about a half a year before rebounding and then came up, it crossed again in June of 74 before the market bottomed out in November. It then crossed again in March of 1980, I believe, maybe, let me see, see if I can zoom in here. Cross, sorry, January of 1980. Uh, the market had a little bit of a drop, right? Maybe about a 15% drop or so from 115 to 100 or so. Um, and then it just went up and then yeah, so the, those this the, here's another one. So here's the one here's the one from 1990 where we went above it. The market immediately sold off, and then that ended up being the low, right? 
uh, before it, it took off again. Here it is. I think we covered this one from 1969. So you can see, I mean, you can see in general, like when it crosses, and again, there's the 50s where it, it was not as useful of a, sig uh, of a signal as, as the SOM rule showed us, right? So looking at it today, just for reference, for those that are curious, the 36 month moving average is at, is at um, 4.38%, 4.38. And we're currently at, at, at 3.9. So just something to consider. Anyways, guys, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.